I really want to take this opportunity to also thank the uh, Creative Liaisons for giving me this wonderful um, opportunity to share thoughts with all of you. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is creative, right? Just who we are as creatives and what we're able to do, what we're able to accomplish when we take a, a bit of a wider look at our craft. Creative contributes to a social shift. It's a big thing to say, right? It's a very aspiring way of approaching creative, but I'm gonna be able to walk you through some ideas and some notions that, you know, makes this very tangible and very achievable as well. Creative that contributes to a social shift, it does it because it's powerful. It, it's important. It creates that social shift by unifying and by polarizing as well. You see what I mean by that a little bit later on. It changes behavior. That's like the ultimate desire of great creative, right? To be able to shift that behavior no matter what we're communicating, right? We need to be able to tap into insights that are socially accurate, culturally accurate to be able to achieve that. It triggers conversation. Sometimes it doesn't necessarily addresses, it addresses a problem without necessarily like getting to an end. Sometimes the problem is like the trigger of that conversation to be able to take it to the next step. That's equally important as well. It's uncomfortable. And that's sign of like good creative as well. It has to be relevant always. It's impactful feels like there's a lot that creative has to do and that creative can do. And it's also beautiful. It's probably one of the things that make us enjoy what we do every day the most. And it matters. That's something that we should never forget. What we do as creative really, really matters, especially when you think of the social context and the shift that creative has the potential of achieving. Now, if we look at our selves as creative, let's, let's look at this art and copy. It seems like an old school term. It's in something that's been around since forever, since advertising existed, right? There's art, there's copy. Somebody decided to make it into teams and that, created a, that generated this creative force. But art and copy put together, it's still relevant to this day. It might express itself in other mediums, right? But we have art directors, we have copywriters that create those teams. And that's so important today. And when you think about it, those teams can actually change the world. When you marry those two, two things together and you get to that nugget that is absolutely magical, then that shift really starts, right? It generates all those little points that are put, put on the previous slide before. Now, for that to work properly, we need to pay attention to our craft, right? I was on a call earlier this morning, which somebody said that creativity is such an optimistic act. And I love that sentence because it is, right? When we approach it that way, it's a lot more refreshing, a lot more motivating, and a lot more important when we think about what we do. But our craft is a privilege. If you take this into context, right? Everyone wants to do something significant. I would say everyone, for the most part, everyone wants to do something significant and contribute to society at a certain point and in a certain way. We are very lucky to have creative as a privilege. We are very lucky to be able to do it. We're very lucky to be able to create visuals, attach words to it, come up with ideas that are going to be out there. When you think about it, you can wake up in the morning, you have an idea, a month later, it's out there. People are looking at it. People are reacting to it. People are behaving a certain way because you generated that story. I had, a, I had a, an interesting chat uh, earlier this week with somebody who mentioned to me, oh, you know, at the end of the day, we're just selling products. Uh, and I thought, well, no, that's not all that we do. Yeah, that might be one of the benefits of what we do, but it's not about that. It's about creating a narrative around that end result. It's about creating a feeling. It's about creating emotion and attaching a sentiment of belonging to it as well. We're able to do that as creative. 
and what a privilege that is. It's absolutely wonderful to do that. And it's up to us really to figure out what exactly are we going to do with that? It'd be super interesting, right? If I would ask every single one of you to tell me what is it that you consider your craft to be and what do you think you can achieve with it? We are all in this business because we love it and we're passionate about it. And we give our souls and we give everything that it's in our heads, put it into our hands and be able to deliver something. And creative is one of those places where nobody can really hide, right? You put everything into it, you put it in front of somebody, they either hate it or they love it, and it's still yours, it's your baby, and you really want it to achieve amazing things. Now, if we take that craft and the love of craft that we have, there's something that in, in approaching it, in, in order to elevate it, in order to be able to achieve perfection of that craft, there's something that we need to be very honest with ourselves, and that is that we don't know. We don't know everything. The I don't know part is humbling, but it's also the trigger to a relentless curiosity. When we are approaching an idea, when we're approaching a comment, a subject, whatever it is, to say that I don't know, it's extremely powerful because when you put that I don't know into action, it opens up all these little doors that you're gonna be looking for because you are curious. I've never met a curator that is not curious, that doesn't have that curiosity. It's going to be super important throughout all our careers, and it has been in mind like for the past 20 years or so, to keep that curiosity alive. And we do it by asking questions. We do it by understanding that we're going to get it wrong because we don't know everything. We do it by reading newspapers, by watching TV shows, all that curiosity really encompasses into that relentless drive that it's going to help us to shift our work to something very, very meaningful. This is something that's super important, uh, I think, in the way that the work is approached. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing, you know, not to know something when you do something with it to sit there and to say, I don't know, and feel helpless about it, not necessarily a good thing, but to feel empowered but not knowing, it's absolutely wonderful, incredibly wonderful. Now, a couple of things that we always gotta keep in mind, right? When we don't know something and we start digging and we find, let's say a subject now that is relevant at that moment, we need to build up on that timing of relevancy of something that's happening in the now. Now, that timing becomes such an essential part of a momentum that will amplify our voice. And what I mean by our voice, I mean our creative voices, right? You guys are gonna be doing wonderful things creatively. They're even more wonderful when they speak to a specific moment, a social moment, right? Something that's happening, could be happening around the world, something that could be happening a little bit more locally, but you already have the ear and the context on the ground. Conversations are already happening about this, but different conversations, all types of conversations are happening at the same time. So what can we do with the creative that we have, with that privilege that we have to be able to shape a story, to craft a story, to get all those insights, to get the timing right, put it together and deliver it out there. You're very powerful, but that relevant timing is something that helps us tremendously. Sometimes it's not always possible, but you should always be on the lookout for that because it allows your project to really live beyond your own expectations. Now, do you guys remember this? I'm sure everyone does. When the war in Ukraine started, there were demonstrations all over the world, uh, anti-war demonstrations, right? Started to create a certain polarizing aspect uh, throughout the world. Uh, 
There was the propaganda around it. There was the for the against, but overall there was a certain humanity attached to it that was not debatable, debatable and that was the, the consequences of, of the war that it had on, on, on people. The reason why I'm showing you guys this is because this is something that happened um, that started with unifying people and polarizing people at the same time, but it was all over the news. When I talk about the relevancy of an idea, this was a very good example, right, of what that relevancy is. When I talk about uh, the timing of an idea to be able to get it out there, this is something that actually helps our creative voices to be heard and to put them into context and have a lot less of an explanation of what this is because everything is happening in the moment that it's happening right now and we're answering to attention that exists socially with a creative solution certain things have to align for that to happen you could have an idea but that idea also needs the craft to be involved to be able to shape it an idea that doesn't see the light of day is just an idea that floats away an idea that really takes the time to be crafted and then to be able to be amplified by the timing of it and the relevance of it, that is something that takes us to a completely other level of the idea that we want to accomplish. And this is what starts unifying everyone in that one single creative voice. I'm not saying that everyone's going to agree with it. But I could tell you that we have the ability to take all of these conversations, put them into one and put them out there. Once we find that commonality that exists globally, in the, in the case of the, uh, of the war in Ukraine, as an example, that is one thing that uh, I think the case that I'm going to show you in, in a little bit did very well, right? We tapped into everything that was happening around the world. And... Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but President Zelensky was giving different talks to different governments around the world. He was invited, I believe he was to the House of Commons in the United States to give a talk, um, uh, same in, in Britain and also in Canada. In Canada, he gave a talk to the, uh, to the Canadian Parliament with uh, our Prime Minister being present there, obviously. And... Uh, it was so significant and so timely that we decided to tap into his speech to be able to really generate an idea that was going to benefit a certain cause for aid of humanitarian aid towards the people uh, that are being affected and impacted very directly um, with the war in Ukraine. What we did with that, I will show it to you. I think I have a little video. It's about a two-minute video, but I want to put it uh, in front of you guys. It's a case that we put forward, but uh, I want to show you how we started crafting about this. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you guys a little bit more about it right after. The first city has fallen to the Russian... Russian forces struck from the air and on the ground and from all directions. Cities were bombarded and tens of thousands flooding across all its borders. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, members of the government, members of the parliament, can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If it was hit by Russian bombs, I would like you to understand, and I would like you to feel this, what we feel every day. The communications agencies partnered to create these shocking images of famous landmarks like the CN Tower and Times Square and what they would look like if missiles and bombs struck them. Exactly what Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky asked us to picture when he addressed the House of Commons in March. Cruise missiles are being falling down on your terrain. They bomb school buildings. And your children are asking you, what happened? Users are invited to visit the website feelwhatwefeel.com to see firsthand these shocking images. Encouraged to donate to Ukrainian charity Razum. 
Razum, one of the world's largest digital charities for Ukraine. Razum has enlisted hundreds of volunteers and raised millions to buy and transport medical supplies to Ukraine. Canada is sending humanitarian relief. Canadians, frankly, have really stepped up. Individual Canadians and businesses across the country have shown us an outpouring of support and solidarity. Ukraine says Canadian help will be key in the battles ahead. That's one of the examples of what we can achieve when we don't keep quiet, right? We have amazing voices as creatives, and it's nice to put them into motion to be able to generate fantastic work that actually matters, that creates that shift, that shifts of behavior, that awareness that leads into action. Super important to really realize how big we can be as creative, which is something that is not easy to do all the time, right? We're very often uh, very much concerned about the day-to-day, -day, which is not something that's going to go away. But it's important to take a step back and look at what we're able to do. I think these talks, these are the type of talks that allow us to do that. And I'm really happy that you guys attend these talks because it allows you to pause. <clears throat> it allows you to pause for a moment and to see what's, what else is out there. What is it that my craft is able to achieve and how can I get to that? Not to forget that it's always going to be a challenge, right? It's that fight of the day to day of like what's urgent today. So I can't really think about what I'm going to do tomorrow. But tomorrow is very powerful when you don't forget about it. Not keeping quiet as creatives. Actually, I've never had a problem with keeping creatives quiet. But not keeping quiet is it, it's another important thing to do. When we're going to do creative pieces, like I said earlier, not everyone is going to agree with them. And that's OK. Sometimes triggering the conversation is as important as anything else. When you think about what happened in the past couple of years, right, the pandemic, there was a lot of like misinformation. There was a lot of tension around the, how is this being handled in this country? This country should not handle it this way. What's happening with my own liberties? Uh, why do I need to wear a mask? I'm not wearing a mask. Why do I need to get vaccinated? I can't believe I have to get a vaccine. Why is the government telling me to get a vaccine? Why are you telling me that I can't go into your store without a mask? You can imagine the human tension that existed in society. And this was a worldly thing, right? You remember this, the idea, the craft, the timing, and the relevance. At times, we need to add bravery to this, right? Bravery in the context that I'm talking about is the bravery to really push a conversation that's been in, uncomfortable, right? If I look at the case that I'm gonna put in front of you guys, it's very specific to vaccines. There's the anti-vaxxers and the pro-vaxxers, and there's the ones on the fence, right? That are a little bit more influential, um, that haven't necessarily made a decision. That said, it is important not to be quiet it is important to understand that we have this beautiful ability to shape a message and put it out there and to think what is the stand that we're going to take as creatives to be able to put something out there that will impact society in a positive way. Creating a conversation is a positive way of being able to do that. Very important to do it. And it has to be done with the idea, with the craft, the timing, the relevance, and bravery. Bravery, not always easy, right? Because a lot of the times, most of the times, creatives are going to be a lot more braver than clients. But this is where the conversation has to be bigger than just the one-off piece that we're going to be doing, right? Conversations are about social impact. That's what our creative does very well. Conversations are about unifying people with that single creative voice.
which is something that we can do as well. Now, I wanna show you a case that we put together uh, that addresses these points that I have here. The idea, the craft, the timing, the relevance, and the bravery. And like I said before, the bravery was based on really generating a conversation. So just to set up what I'm about to show you guys, you know, there was a lot of misinformation happening on vaccines through Twitter, through Facebook, a lot of social media, subgroups that started, right? Uh, certain misconceptions and people bought them. It was, it's not always very easy to be able to uh, really get the message super clear. So we wanted to really put something forward to um, really try to clarify this conversation or at least to make people understand where the conversation is coming from. And the, uh, the way we approach it, we tapped into other things that have been coming from misinformation, right? As an example, there was a, a hurricane in the United States um, in which somebody had tweeted at one point that they were checking in shelters for IDs from everyone to get in. What that did, it put in danger a lot of illegal immigrants that were in the United States in that sector. So those people did not want to go to the shelters because of fear of getting deported. And that caused death of these people that they were not had access to shelter, but it was all false. It wasn't real, right? But it still had traction. So just to be able to generate awareness of what that could cause was important to us, right? And to be able to generate that conversation was also important to us. I'll show you the case so you guys can take a look at it. Right. So when we think about what we do and how we do it, this tool that we have as creatives is one that really allows us to be unified as a voice, especially when we find that global insight that is relevant and true to all of us. We're not that different across the world. We're all human beings looking for the same things. If you look at where we are in society, our struggles are quite similar, right? I mean, some countries, obviously, culturally and politically, the struggles are a lot more acute than they are in other countries, but we're all human beings at one point, and there's a common truth that exists between all of us. And that's where our creative could really be that voice that unifies us all, all right? So, that is it for me. It has been an absolute pleasure to share this with you. And I would love to uh, open the floor for any discussion. Hello, I'm RJ. I'm from DDB Manila, Philippines. I'm a senior copywriter. Hi, Hi, nice, to meet you. nice to meet you. Um, sorry, it's not a question, but I'm really interested with what you've shown earlier. The, the case video about uh, Ukraine. Yeah, where you 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 show the possibilities of what will happen if the if war 
will actually expand or will, will go yeah. beyond beyond Ukraine. I would really like to know the thinking behind the strategy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like everything from scratch because it's really interesting. I mean, so, I got, yeah, perfect. I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it from scratch just for you. So, you know, like I mentioned, like uh, President Zelensky had been doing the speeches throughout the government, right? Um, I'll tell you how the idea was born. Um, we were all paying attention to what he was going to be telling the Canadian Parliament. And in his words, he said, I want you to feel what we feel. And then he addressed uh, Prime Minister Trudeau directly and saying, imagine what it would feel uh, to have the CN Tower, which is a landmark in Toronto, to be bombed. Imagine how the Ottawa airport, what it would feel like to have that airport bombed. So, his intention was really to bring the war a lot closer to us so that we can feel something, right? Which is like what we try to do, right? Bring our work as close to people so they can feel something as well. So there was a creative team that came immediately the day after that speech and said, oh, there's a great opportunity here. Why don't we do exactly what he said, right? And make sure to get it as close as possible to home to be able to make people feel what they feel, right? So. That trigger everything in motion, right? Of course, you have creatives that are all super excited about this. Uh, it just so happened that the Oscars were just happening that the uh, that night, and uh, there's a company called Rodeo Effects that had won the Oscar for uh, uh, special effects in Dune. Just so happens that, that company is our neighbor here in Montreal where we're based. So we got on the phone with Rodeo FX and we said, listen, we have this great idea. We need the ability that you guys have with the craft to help us elevate this idea. They jump right in it, right? All of this was pro bono. They jump right in it and say, absolutely, let's do it. I'll put you in touch with one of the best artists that I have in LA. And everything started to work from there. After that, it was just a question to find an organization that was going to help us really push this out. And that was RASM. And the rest is history, right? So the, the insight, if you, you know, you're asking about the strategy, the insight was given to us by the speech of President Zelensky, in all honesty. It's one of those like gifts where you didn't have to dig that much. He actually gave it to you. Now, if we wouldn't have been paying attention, those things come and go. And then we're like, hmm, you know, we forget about it, which is why that curiosity that I was talking about, it's super important to be able to, to, to be always like on the lookout, to be able to see what is it that we can take and amplify as a big idea. Does that answer your question? Yes, absolutely. Actually, I learned so many things. And I would like to say thank you because I really love the, the, the time, the idea plus craft plus timing, plus relevance, plus bravery. It really fits everything that you, even the example that you've shown with the with the Ukraine, it, it, it encapsulates everything, yeah. that, that, that model. So yeah, thank Great. you so much, I really, well, Thank really you, really thank you. Thank, thank you, you much. Thanks. Hi, Martinez. Hi, I'm Kupita. I am based out of India. I work for Virtue Worldwide as an Associate Creative Director. And Very copy nice based, to uh, right? Uh, nice to meet you. The question, yeah, same here. Uh, the question I had in mind was that, you know, on a lot of occasions, we do have the idea, we have the craft more or less in place. And, uh, you know, we know that this is the right time to do it. But yeah. in your case, and if you can like talk us through like how it went with the particular uh, project that we were you were showing us today, how do you really go about talking to the brand or, uh, you know, a, like a client and convince them that, you know, it is important for this idea to go out into the world. Because in a lot of occasions, brands don't exist to like push a purpose, right? But how do you get them around to see the importance of what's in it for them and also why this is a very important conversation to have? Yeah, that is like the magic question that you got right there. Huh? That is like, uh, when I talk about universal truth, that is one of them. That is like one universal problem that we all have. Now, I'll tell you the way that we approach work, and in all honesty, sometimes the work is done, and then we need to find a client that's going to be able to back it, right? We are relentless 
and trying to find a client. I, I'll tell you something that I've done recently. I show a client a great idea, great idea. And I tell them flat out, it's not yours until you buy it, right? The conversation changes so quickly because everyone wants what they can have. And I've been very transparent, you know, you don't pick this up. The idea is so important that somebody else is going to pick it up and will bring it to somebody else. Not because I don't believe in you as a client, but I believe in the idea and I need you to believe in the idea as much as I, as much as I believe in you as a client. So it has to work both ways, you know, as creatives, we're very often on uh, this corner where we feel like we're at the mercy of the client. Well, they kind of like, you know, they sign the check. So on that point, we might be, but, you know, they hire us to bring things that are unexpected because they are not thinking that way. They are thinking about another side of the business, and they give us that space, for the most part, to be able to generate that shift in ideas that come. It's never going to happen 100% success. So that's never going to happen, you know? But being relentless and knowing that you're going to be getting more no's than yes is just part of who we are and what we do. So, but when the idea is good, the idea drives everything and everyone's going to want it. And you got to trust that the idea is so good that the conversation will stick, if not with you, plan number one, with somebody else. I can guarantee you that. So there's a type of aggressiveness attached to it that I like to refer as belief, right? The belief that we have on the idea that we have to put forward. You also need great relationships with the clients, right? Relationships that are not only owned by accounts, but also owned by creatives. You need that creative presence, that trust, right? I always tell the creatives that, that I work with, like the best place to be is when the client says, well, let me run this by the creatives before we do it. And then you're like, ah, okay, we got it. We got into that spot in which that trust is there. It's not a blind trust, it's an earned trust, right? That now you have proven that, wow, what you're putting forward actually is gonna have a big impact, right? So that's the, uh, I wish I could give you like a, an answer, like oh, you do this and this and this, you know? I, I wish, because if you find what it is, you let me know because it's a struggle that will continue, that will continue there. But being relentless and really believing on what we do usually ends up very positive. Thank you so much. It actually helps, like, uh, especially this line of thinking that we have the idea and you can have it, but it's not like you're the only one who can do it. Probably, you know, that shift kind of, like makes it a more equal transaction than being at the mercy of somebody and Absolutely. trying to convince them that you're the only one who can do this. So yeah, yeah. that was a great, uh, you know, uh, insight that way. And you gotta be quite brave to, the, to yeah. say that, you know, so, but it works. I could tell you it works. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, first of all, Marty, for the presentation. Um, um, Look, we see in many brands nowadays, um, you know, uh, the so-called segmentation, right? Mega segmentation of the market. So uh, instead of, you know, big brands with a one size fits all, you see many smaller brands because people like to have, you know, the communication tailored to them. Of course, we know that that's the, the 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 mega trend. I wanted to hear your perspective, um, you know, and, and that's all that's all coming from you know algorithms and the bubbles and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I want to hear your perspective on health and uh, how this uh, mega segmentation of audiences affects your work in health. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, how how does that challenge you? And if that does challenge you, how do you tackle? um this uh you know yeah micro segmentation mega segmentation i don't know so the segmentation that you're referring to is this more like uh based on culture or based on um specific market restrictions or based on i think based on culture mostly yeah yeah, yeah. just like identity right more and yeah. more identities yeah yeah so 
super interesting question. Um, honestly, uh, really, really interesting question because it definitely impacts the creative tremendously, especially in, in health, right? Um, health is the one thing, I would say sickness is the one thing that it's the great equalizer amongst all. Now, access to health is the de-equalizer right culturally to all of us because we don't all have the same access to health um it could be based on pricing of a medication or it could just be based on access to health care that depends on the country that this is happening the way that that impacts us is so the way that we tackle this let's say we if we work with a health product that is accessible globally the first thing is like to find a common thread, right? That's going to be relevant for every single one of those markets, no matter what the culture is. It's very difficult to do, right? Because if I say blue here, you know, that's bad in Asia, as an example, or it could be great in Latin America, but not here. So we try to find, first of all, what is that common tension that exists, right? Um, not only at a human level, but also as a business level. Once that is found and we have that tension and we have that positioning that is more aspiring than actionable right now because it's at that top level, how can we honestly say that that belief is going to trickle down to specific markets and continue to push toward that idea, that bigger idea uh, directly? Knowing very well that every different market has different budgets, different restrictions, right? Different types of access, All, it's, it's a nightmare, right? So when you're able to convince a client that that belief is bigger than the actions that happen on a daily basis, but the actions that happen on a daily basis, no matter how limiting, really answer a bigger goal, it becomes a lot easier to implement. So for me, that is a way to have a global approach that needs to be localized. It's not top down, it's bottom up. The markets will believe because of all the segmentation that that bigger idea really impacts and benefits their market as well. How they do it, it's gonna be very different on every single market. So that allows you to really tap into the segmentations with a greater goal. Right, So it impacts creative in the way that when you express the creative, in the way that you're going to be casting for those markets, in the way that you're going to be showing, in the language that you're going to be talking, but all is going to ladder up to the bigger idea. Some of them are going to go a lot more streamlined towards a bigger idea. So the ones are going to go through loops to be able to the bigger idea. But the belief that there's something greater on what you do every single day, it's, it's quite an important one to be able to drive all those different segmentation towards one goal. Did that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, also, uh, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting to think about the, um, I can't even begin to imagine how many restrictions and and uh, um, different laws in different countries and different like uh, regulations for, for medical activities will it impact your, your creative overall idea, right? Because you got to be careful. You can't be that, like, if I understand it correctly, you can't be so specific that you're going to yeah. talk about one specific product benefit that yeah, exactly. might not be legal in one of the regions. And then yeah. what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Patrick. Hi, Patrick. I'm from DDB Philippines, same as RJ. Uh, I'm senior art director. Uh, I have one question. Because uh, I've what you've shown about finding the real facts was really interesting, especially in our country. Uh, it's really relevant because we just held our election, and uh, it's really you know, uh, our people were really misinformed about the facts, and it really affected right. the results of the elections. So my question is: With that being said, uh, how do you make people believe the facts? when they're already misinformed and they think that whatever they've heard or have seen online were the truth, even if it's not. Like, how yeah. do you do that when everyone is being bombarded by lies and misinformation already and they believe it like it's the truth? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, 
I don't think you can make people believe the facts. I don't think you can do that. I think you can put facts in front of them and create access to facts to be able to create that shift. If I uh, talk a little bit about the vaccines example, there's like, you know, uh, we were talking about segments before, but there's three segments. There's the ones that don't believe on anything, right? You're never gonna convince them. They are the ones that believe, so that's good. And there are the ones in between that are that could be more influence on what we're going to be saying, on how you're going to be saying. So that is kind of like your sweet spot to be able to start communicating to people. There's a huge machine in misinformation, especially when it comes to politics. But are different. There are several tactics that could be done, and different creative ways that could be done to be able to really. Uh, expose the reality of what's being said. I'll give you a good example. Uh, Gray did a campaign uh, for the elections in Brazil, I think it was three years ago, so maybe more, in which they put up posters all over the city of uh, candidates, right? The reason why I'm giving you this example is because it reminds me very well about just what's happening in the Philippines. They put up QR code on those posters, and it was as simple as putting your phone of it, and it will reveal the history of this candidate, right? Either money laundry, criminal records, whatever it is, everything was there now in your hand exposing this. You didn't have to dig. That was information that was brought into their hands to be able for them to make a decision. So when I say that you can make them believe the facts, you could definitely put the facts in front of them and ask them, what are you going to do now, right? Now that you have the facts. When you have um, misinformation that's not being challenged, everything is lost. When you have misinformation that is being challenged, then there's a doubt that exists that would allow people to start digging more. If you make the digging a lot easier for them, then there's less digging, and then you kind of like counter that misinformation in a more um, eloquent and creative way as well. Not an easy solve, right? Try to convince somebody yeah. of thinking differently. I mean, when you think about it, it comes from like, generations and mindsets, education, culture, or certain things that happened during their lives. You know, I think we've seen it in the United States, uh, we saw it in the Philippines, and we will continue to see that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marty. That, that really answers you know, my question. Uh, one last question, Marty. Um, since you've been saying uh, the word bravery uh, ever since you started the talk and with your with your questions i'm really curious like just patrick uh, just like what patrick mentioned that we just elected the son of a former dictator and it's really frustrating yeah. in the philippines because yeah. you won by a disinformation and now right. if we talk bravery like how do you, you personally i would like to ask you how do you gauge bravery like what how do you say that you've already reached the limit of being brave? How do you push the conversation? What's the edge? What's the limit? Uh, where where are you going to stop? Where do you know that you're going to stop? That you're not stepping any um, any boundaries or, or or anything? So yeah. So there's no limit, right? What bravery is to you might be different to Patrick. Might be different to me right? My bravery, the way that I measure my bravery is how afraid am, am I of getting this wrong? If I'm very, very, very afraid to get it wrong and I still do it, that's bravery to me because I actually really believed in this and I was less concerned about what everyone else was going to think about it because I knew it was going to generate uh, uh, tension. For, for sure, it was going to generate tension. I was going to make a lot of enemies. I was going to get a lot of phone calls that disagree with me, but I still did it because on my core, I believe it was the right thing to do. That's bravery. Not being afraid to fall flat on your face, right? Because you did something wrong. That's bravery. And the bravery comes when you fall flat and you have a, a CCO, a CD that says, fantastic, just get up and we'll continue to move forward versus getting it wrong and being afraid of being beaten down. That's not gonna happen. That is not bravery, right? That's just fear. It's very different. Yeah. 
So it's limitless, right? It's going to be whatever you decide that it's going to be, that bravery. What is it for you? What is your comfort zone? What do you want to push it? How much do you want to push it? And bit by bit, if we all start behaving that way, then the changes become quite big. Yep, clear. Thank you so much, Marty. <laughs> You're very welcome. Hi, Marty. Um, I'm hey, Kim you? from the Philippines. Um, I just want to ask, um, um, it's very similar to what RJ and Patrick has opened up about the government here in the Philippines. So I think creating a political conversation here in the Philippines um, might be too risky and might yeah. bring you over the edge. So my question is, I want to know what are your best practices in terms of ideating in such a way it would not be too abrasive, mm -hmm. both for the government and its citizens. So how do you do, um, deal with those things? What are your best practices about it? Yeah, it really is about having a strategy that is relevant to the market that you're talking about. You can go blindly into something, right? You can you have to know who you're speaking to and what your intention is going to be. Um, as an example, you know, I, I'll go back to what you guys are living in the Philippines right now, which I find fascinating, super interesting, because it, it feels like regression, right, versus progression. Um, from from what I've read, right, and I, I, my, my exposure to it is like reading uh, newspaper articles. Uh, but I think that when you are aware of what the political stance is right now, what the climate is, what the pros and the cons are, as informed as you could be, it allows your strategy to be informed and to find that little niche, that little spot, that little opening right, where you can start pushing your message forward. It doesn't mean that you got to go bold and shock the system and end in jail because you decided to do something, right? That will do the opposite effect of what we're trying to accomplish. You got to be smart about it. And just finding that little crack in the system to be able to say something, that's bravery as well, right, versus just ignoring it. When I said and during the uh, one of the slides, I, I said, like, we can't keep quiet. Right, we can't. But it doesn't mean you know take a baseball bat and start ramming everywhere. That's not what it means. It means be smart about it. How are you going to use your voice and this beautiful craft that you own to be able to really elevate the messages that need to be elevated and get them out there? You gotta be smart not to be shut down, right? If if you if you're not smart about it and you don't have a strategic partner to be able to help you navigate all of that with that knowledge, then it becomes counterproductive a little bit. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for the Yeah, I think, I think it's very helpful. And um, I agree with what you've said that we need to find that thin line that would really meet and would not sound very attacking for both parties. Yeah. Right. Thanks. You're welcome. This was super, super interesting, insightful, Marty. It was really great advice, you know, on executing one's craft while being brave and smart all at the same time. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. And thank you to everyone who attended the session. Thank you very much, everyone. What a pleasure, honestly. Pleasure and an honor to be here. So thank you very much.